My name is Shirley Zinn. Um, we are at USB Ed, and um, the event is We Read For You. Um, the book is called Swimming Upstream, and it is a book about my personal and professional journey, and it's been written in the hope of inspiring young people to rise above the adversity and to be inspired by hope. So the story really is, is about my growing up. I grew up on the Cape Flats in the Western Cape. And I have to tell you that from a socioeconomic point of view, it's probably got every challenge that you can hope to find there. Everything from drugs, gangs, gangsterism, alcoholism, domestic violence, teenage pregnancies, unemployment, you know, abject poverty, very little hope for people. And, um, and it's, a, it's a sad indictment, I think, after all these years that we still have a situation like that prevailing um, um, in, our, in our environment. But um, from a very, very young age, um, my parents were starting to plant seeds. They themselves were just ordinary um, uh, working people. They worked really, very really hard. And I learned a lot about, you know, excellence and working hard, the hard work ethic through them. And so for me, it was always about continue to learn. And, uh, and I want to, it's one of the first lessons I want to share with you today. Even if you have a doctorate, you have to continue to learn in order to stay on top of your game. Uh, my father was um, kind of a lay minister in, in, the, in the church. And the messages that he had for us was always about financial independence. Do not depend on anybody to pay your way for you in life. And so these are some of the lessons I learned from a, from a very, very early age. My mom, on the other hand, um, also very deeply values driven, but was more about respect for other people. My grandmother also had a very important role in our lives because that's where we ended up after school. And I think if I have to acknowledge her, she, she inculcated within us a sense of discipline, a sense of, you know, punctuality about things, a sense of order in chaos, you know, try and, 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 and be disciplined in the way you approach your life. And I think that was a very important lesson that I maybe didn't value as a young person growing up, but I do value now that I look back. And so, um, you know, being at, at South Peninsula High, they, you know, surrounded by some, very, some amazing teachers. And this is why I'm so passionate about education today. I think education is in a fairly appalling state of affairs today. And so I had these two teachers, the two of them said to me, you know, you're not the brightest P in the pod when it, academically, you know, but you've got the potential to do so much more. And you know what? I could have chosen to listen to just that first bit and ignored the second bit. Each one of us are gifted with various talents and many of us do not use even half of what is within us. The golden nuggets are never unleashed. These two teachers, go home and have a conversation with your parents about university. Now, you must understand that that was just not going to be possible. We didn't even know properly what that meant, other than it costed a lot of money and time to do this. And the whole aspiration was just to finish matric. I went back to the school the next day, and they actually helped me to fill in my forms for bursaries, fill in my forms for applications to different institutions. And I started to go to the University of the Western Cape. Now I'm going to give away my age, in 1980. I was first year in, in, uh, at UWC, I uh, matriculated in 1979. And for me, I started to put together, connect the dots between, you know, you know the, the political environment, the economic environment, education, and, and, and the whole socio-economic aspects, and, and why it was that we were in the, in the situation we were. And I managed to finish that. I finished my diploma in education. And you, can, you must remember, the only way we could get a bursary back then was for becoming a teacher, I think a social worker and nurse. nurse yes and here's the lesson that i learned in all of that sometimes you've got to just start somewhere okay it's not the perfect place it's not exactly what it is that you wanted but it could be an opportunity missed but anyway i thought well i can do one degree maybe i can keep going just to see you know how far i can actually take this and so i went to teach i did my four years of mandatory teaching and i um, i kept studying i was i did a b ed honors through unisa while i was teaching and then I uh, got a job at the University of the Western Cape, where I was a lecturer in teacher education for 10 years. And I did a master's while I was there. And then, of course, I met Kevin as well. 
And then um, his mom actually cut me, uh, we, we like to travel, so she cut me a little snippet out and she said, I know you like to study and you like to travel and maybe this is a way to do it. So this is a Harvard South African Fellowship looking for applications, calling for applications that particular year. I finished the one master's at, 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 at UWC and the next month I started with a second master's at Harvard and started, kind of got into educational psychology in the end. And I was surrounded by the most amazing supervisor. Now this is, was a, this is very important. The lesson that I took out of that was you need to deliberately surround yourself with people who will uplift and inspire you. And he said to me, no, you must get into the doctoral program. And I said, no, I'm done with all this stuff. I've come much too far. I didn't think I would even get this far. And he said to me, no, no, you've got to apply and we'll, you know. And the other part was I didn't have the money to pay. This was the other piece. Um, I wouldn't have had a scholarship for the, for the doctorate. So I came home and I, um, Kevin and I got married in 92. And, um, and in 93, I managed to uh, persuade him and I said to him, wouldn't you like to go with me to Harvard? I got into the doctoral program. And, um, and then he gave up his job, sold his motorbike and his Alpies. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, he, um, and he packed up and came along with me into the unknown, right? I didn't have a scholarship for the doctorate, so I worked three jobs. I was working in the alumni office, I was a graduate student in the international office and a few other things I was doing. But if I had done the math before, I'd have figured out I would never be able to pay the tuition. Be even on my full-time salary, I would never be able to pay the tuition. Um, and so, um, never mind the accommodation. So about three or so months, four months in, I was, we were broke, like literally broke. I actually went to financial aid and I said, you know what, I'm so sorry that I haven't paid my tuition fees for the last three months and my accommodation. And actually, I don't think I'm able to afford to pay it back. Maybe we should just go home, actually. And she said to me, I just wait a sec, let's just have a look at your performance. She pulled out my little file and she had a look and she said, if you continue to perform in this way, we will assist you with tuition fees. And I finished ahead of my cohort in 97. So I graduated in 97. And, um, and if um, 93 to 97, which was the start and the end of the doctorate, wasn't enough, I gave birth in 95 um, <laughs> to Jamie. It was just an amazing time for us. It was absolutely amazing time for us. We came back and um, I wanted to work for the Western Cape Education Department. And so I was all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, fresh doctorate under my arm and went in there, had a few interviews, and then they said to me, we have nothing to put your profile. But I have to tell you now, when I look back, that door had closed on me, but a much larger door had opened that I would never have seen without the benefit of the hindsight now. So what happened was uh, I was very disappointed. And the other lesson I learned in this as well, do not stay angry for too long. Okay, and so I um, applied for a, a job as a training manager at Southern Life. I don't know how many of you remember Southern Life in those days. Um, anyway, the second difficult thing I had to do with Kevin was to say, I landed a job now in Pretoria, you know. <coughs> but we migrated up and then my parents-in-law came along to help with, our, uh, with, with Jamie. The part that I do want to tell you is that I was at a company called Rickett Benkiza. They're FMCG, Fast Moving Consumer Goods, listed on the London Stock Exchange. Was responsible for Africa Middle East at the time, and had lots of traveling to do, um, eight countries to, to, to think of in Africa Middle East and got the line to London. And so it was a hectic time um, um, in, in my own career, it was like really flying. Um, we used to come backwards and forwards to Cape Town, you know, to, to visit family um, and, and, and go back again. And on the 3rd of January 2003, we were driving just here on the end to past the airport, um, on a Friday afternoon at about half past one and somebody hit us from behind um, at, at quite a, a huge speed and, um, and we lost Jamie in a car accident, in a terrible car accident. He's the only child, he was seven years old at the time. He would have been 21 this year, so this is an important year for, for me as well. But it was a, an extreme devastation for us um, and something that I didn't think that I would ever, or Kevin and I would ever recover from. I had a pretty good experience in life until then. I had the most amazing things, and then, and then, and then this. And 
I was, I was very seriously injured. They actually didn't think I was going to live for the first 24 hours. My parents and Kevin didn't know whether to tell me what had actually happened on the road. That first, the first few hours trying to process all of this, I, I really, you know, I, it's it just, I, I cannot even begin to explain to you how tough it was. And I think every day it's a, it's a, it's a journey. So I can, you can never get, you know, get over a tragedy like that. And this is the other thing I, I had to take on board as well, that amidst all of this sadness, um, there were many things to be grateful for. And one of them is that I was a mother, that I had a beautiful boy, and, um, and that it is unfortunate that I lost him, but I was very blessed to, to have had him. And, um, and so the book is dedicated, um, dedicated to Jamie because it taught me, you know, so many, gave me so many perspectives on life. And even as I reflect now, I'm, I'm very appreciative for that. And the other thing that we don't do when we have setbacks like this is take the time out to get the healing done. But what I realized after a few sessions is that we have an innate ability, an inner ability to pull ourselves through some of the most difficult things that life will throw at you. We have that resilience and we have the tenacity to pull ourselves through. What I had to do was to pull myself up from inside of my soul and find a way to actually deal with my reality as it, as it was, my new reality as it was. Our lives had effectively changed forever in that moment. And so I took out some time and I went back to Harvard and I spent time with the people there because they knew they'd seen me pregnant, they'd seen me given birth and they'd heard the story. And I went back there and I spent some time with them and then I came back home here. So what this does as well, it, gives, it knocks one's confidence, right? It knocks your confidence so hard you actually don't know whether you can go, go and do half of what you were doing before. And so um, I decided I'll start Shirley's in consulting. Actually, that's when that started in 2003 already. And I decided I'll never go back to a corporate because I don't know what I can and can't do anymore. I got the message one day that, um, you know, Pravin Gordon is um, interviewing for a head of HR at SARS. He's done, done plenty of interviews already. He's just doing the last you know, whip around, wouldn't you like to go and chat to him? And I was like, Prime Gordon, no way, you know, because he's, I mean, those of you know, a, a, a huge taskmaster, very focused, high delivery person. And I just wasn't sure that I could do that. But here was this great taskmaster and he was saying, I think you need to join us, actually. You know, give it a go, let's see what happens. And for me, being in HR is really about building building organizations that care about people and put the people first. It was an amazing uh, a task to work at SARS, do the turnaround of SARS, get the modernization going. So all of you, you know, I hope you are paying your taxes. Um, I went on to Nedbank. I'm not going to give you the whole story, but it was also a financial turnaround and a bailout by All Mutual and huge financial targets that had to be achieved. That's a, a really a good case study for any MBA class to understand. And then, of course, the unthinkable happened. Um, I would never have gone to um, the Blue Bank. And so I went across. And as if I had not been tested enough, on the 4th of October 2010, I joined Standard Bank. And Jack and Marie was still the CEO. And he said to me, Shirley, we hadn't discussed this before, but actually 2,000 people have to be retrenched. The board has just decided. You know, so we need a roadmap by the end of the day. And the next day, we're going to do staff and media and all the rest of it. Now, for those of you holding senior positions, or in holding any position in a corporate, you would understand the devastation that this brings. And it was a very tough two years inside of Standard Bank around those challenges. Um, but it also, I think, um, lent itself to me growing and learning how to work with huge complexity. Um, but I finished up almost exactly two years later to the date at Standard Bank. And I resurrected Shirley's in consulting. And so just to bring you all the way back, now I serve on a few boards um, and, um, and, and, and still doing some academic work um, attached to some institutions. And so, so that's a broad summary of the, the story and the, some of the key lessons learned. And as I, as I just move to closure and we'll take some questions, I just want to share with you some of these, some of these, these, these um, thoughts. I think um, I'm very inspired um, by, by Nelson Mandela's leadership. And I think... You know, I just want to quote a few. Everyone can rise above their circumstances and achieve success if they are dedicated to and passionate about what they do. 
I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. And I'm going to stop there. I'm going to say thank you very much for being such great listeners. And I'm very happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you.